Well, howdy there, Internet people. It's Bo again. Don't worry, you're not watching the wrong channel. Just roll with it. Well, hello again. Welcome back to Coup de Gras 2, Electric Luau, Day 2. We are here with the Solar Punk Farmer, ready for their panel on regenerative agriculture. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? <laughs> oh, wonderful. I'm absolutely excited that we could have you here today, and I will let you take it away. All right. I'm just posting these links to my Facebook so that people can see it. Uh, so just give me a moment, please. Try not to make this take too long. <laughs> um, Okay. Um, sounds good. This looks good now. All right. Uh, so I think we're good. Uh, let me share my screen. Share screen. Okay. All right. Inception. <laughs> Let's not do that. <laughs> okay. All right. Can can you all see and hear me all right? Just want to make sure we look good. I uh, will get started in a moment. Uh, this is going to be a very interesting talk. Um, I'm very excited for this. <laughs> so I'm going to just 
get my notes up right here because this is going to be uh, we're going to be talking about a lot in this talk, and it's it's going to be a lot of material, a lot of ground to cover. But uh, I'm really excited. This is a really interesting topic, and, and you know I've I've been wanting to you know turn a lot of anarchists on to the subject of regenerative agriculture and how it's it's really applicable to the anarchist program and movement. Uh, so this this uh, presentation is called Radical Agriculture, named after a uh, Bookchin's work towards an anarchist land ethic through regenerative farming. Uh, so um, here are the. Uh, this is actually I skipped a slide. <laughs> who I am. Um, so I'm just your local friendly solar punk YouTuber, and I make content about gardening. I talk about aquaponics. I talk about regenerative agriculture. I talk about permaculture and uh, various other topics. Uh, we'll be doing uh, more content like this on my channel where I talk about uh, political environmental philosophy as it applies to uh, the solar punk movement and to uh, agriculture in general in the future. So uh, make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel uh, so you can uh, see future content. Uh, I've been putting out uh, more content lately. So um, yeah, so um, I'm also an urban agriculture and aquaponics uh, practitioner in the Los Angeles area. I've been involved in urban agriculture for about seven years now and aquaponics for four years. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty seasoned, pretty spicy. <laughs> um, and I've done most of the work that I've done in a local food desert communities. Uh, that is a communities that uh, struggle with accessing fresh, healthy food uh, due to a lack of supermarkets, uh, difficulty uh, with transportation um, and uh, just, uh, you know, poverty in general. And I've also been uh, studying uh, environmental philosophy and uh, politics for quite a while, um, both within and outside of an academic setting. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the objectives of this presentation. So the first thing that I want to do is formulate a, an anarchist critique of the relationship our modern society has to nature. Uh, why is the relationship that our society have towards nature hierarchical, authoritarian, and authoritarian and unjust? And how uh, did this relationship develop in terms of its historical lineage? Uh, then I want to propose an alternative. I want to formulate an anarchist environmental ethic that applies to relations between humans and terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, so basically, you know, how can we relate to uh, the natural world in an anarchist way? And then how can we conduct ourselves along those lines so that we don't act in an, an authoritarian and oppressive way towards other life forms on this planet? Um, and ecosystems in general. Then I want to demonstrate the application of this ethic. I want to show how this ethic can be applied within the realm of agriculture by anyone who can grow food. So this presentation ultimately is going to be about growing food in an anarchist way. And it's a very exciting topic. And, and you know, I, I don't oftentimes see uh, food production discussed uh, uh, either within the anarchist movement or within the left in general. I know some of you are going to be left wing, some of you are going to be more right wing, but I'm, I'm also a part of the left. And, you know, the, the left doesn't really talk about it that much either. So, <laughs> and, but it's, it's a very important topic uh, because uh, ultimately, if, if you have a growing movement, you're going to need to be able to grow foods to sustain it. And we need to start talking about, like, you know, how we can accomplish, uh, how we can achieve food sovereignty uh, within our movement and how uh, we can begin uh, building the basis for a new society. And food production is a very important part of it. Food is the basis of our civilization. And so we're gonna need to uh, produce food in a way that is in line with our values. Uh, so I wanted to first uh, talk a little bit about the prime directive of anarchism, which uh, y'all should be familiar with. Uh, and uh, um, it's basically the idea that all hierarchical institutions should be subject to critique, and if they could not justify themselves, then they should be abolished. And so I wanted to put this Noam Chomsky quote here, um, but uh, that is what I've always understood to be the essence of anarchism, the conviction that the burden of proof must be placed on authority and that it should be dismantled if that burden cannot be met. Um, so uh, that's pretty much the philosophical basis of anarchism throughout much of its history. Uh, and... Um, and this is where we're going to take our critique. This is going to be the starting point for, for the critique I'm going to present um, of our relationship uh, with the natural world and uh, the, our industrial food system uh, throughout the course of this presentation. Uh, so I believe that the anarchist critique should be extended to environmental issues. And normally the, this critique is applied uh, to patriarchy, to racism, to capitalism, uh, to homophobia, to transphobia, um, to imperialism, but I, I think we should 
uh, extend this critique because ultimately the way that we behave towards each other is going to be reflected in the way that we treat the environment. And, and this is something that uh, um, uh, political philosopher Murray Bookchin uh, really understood and, and that many indigenous people have understood throughout the course of history. And they constructed their relationships with each other around, you know, the way that they've been relating uh, to the natural world. Uh, so, and a social ecology is a revolutionary social theory that proposes the domination of nature by humans is a product of the domination of humans by humans. So the hierarchical power structures that exist within our society throughout the course of history have been reproduced in the way that we interact with the other life forms and with the environment. Uh, so uh, therefore, I believe that we should extend the anarchist critique to environmental issues. Uh, so I just want to talk a little bit about um, Bookchin's social ecology. And, and Bookchin said, what defines social ecology is it's as social is its recognition that the often overlooked fact that nearly all our present ecological problems arise from deep-seated social problems. Conversely, pr our present ecological problems cannot be clearly understood, much less resolved, without resolutely dealing with problems within society. Uh, so um, given this, you know, it's, it's very clear that uh, if, if we apply an ecological critique to anarchism and anarchist thought, that could be very powerful. And, and that could really dig deep into the root causes of, of all these ecological problems that we're facing today. Uh, so Bookchin also said that in the medieval world, again, one finds the natural world organized hierarchically, just as medieval society was organized hierarchically. One finds there a king of the beasts because one lives amidst kings, and one finds lowly ants because one lives in a social world built around the labor of lowly serfs. So very relevant. And then this um, relation has existed throughout history. Uh, Bookchin also wrote about uh, how this relation was present in ancient Greek society, how there was a distinction between uh, wild and tamed nature within Greek society. Um, and uh, this arose from social relations within, within Greek society and also um, in indigenous society. Uh, Bookchin spoke of the Algonquins uh, who had a very uh, egalitarian society and organized in clans and their view of the natural world was reflected in that. Uh, they, they saw the beavers as organizing clans and the other animals organizing clans. So we, we project the way that our, our views of the social world onto nature. And then that our social views, that that projection really stems from a concept called reification that was originally introduced by introduced by the Marxists. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, some of you may not be fond of Marxism, but, you know, I think that there are some things we can take from it uh, that, that have a really good critical edge we could apply to uh, anarchism. And, and one of them is this concept of reification. Uh, so um, Marxist uh, writer uh, Gaho Petrovic uh, wrote that the act or the result of the act of trend, that reification is the act or result of the act of transforming human properties, relations and actions into properties, relations and actions of man produced things which have become independent and which are imagined as originally independent of man and govern his life. Also transformation of human beings into thing like beings, which do not behave in a human way, but according to the laws of the thing world. Reification is a special case of alienation. It's most radical and widespread form characteristic of modern capitalist society. And uh, this uh, notion of reification was extended to our relations with nature uh, by um, a, a writer and professor John Bellamy Foster, uh, who essentially said that the reification of nature is taking social relationships or relations between people and nature and turning them into relations between things. That way, nature has been transformed into an object within a matrix of, of the capitalist relations of production. And as anarchists, we could say the hierarchical relations that are present within our society. We project these things onto nature and take them to be a given. Uh, so what essentially this means is that nature has been transformed from an array of subjects that is living creatures with a subjective experience and turned into an object that is separate from humans because nature really includes humans. We are a product of nature. We are a product of millions of years of evolution and all of these traits that we have that have allowed us to construct an advanced civilization we acquired through evolution by natural selection. So we really are a part of nature. And, and you know, the, the, the way that we view nature, the dominant ideological social construction of nature views us as separate from nature. So nature has been reified. 
And uh, this this reification in Western culture can trace its historical lineage back uh, to Genesis in the Bible, uh, where in the Garden of Eden. So it's it's really the fall from Eden, you know, has been uh, used in this way to to promote this reification of nature, uh, especially uh, throughout the Renaissance and Enlightenment periods. Um, and I'm not trying to bag on Christianity. I know they're a Christian anarchist, and and they're totally legit, and that's a really interesting and uh, powerful take on anarchism. Um, but uh, I think this is, you know, really where it, it all began, kind of. And, and uh, I'm going to quote the Bible here. Uh, this is Genesis 3:17 to 3:19. Uh, to Adam he said, "Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field." By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you are taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Uh, so man became removed from the garden, removed from nature, and forced to work the land to survive, forced to engage in the process of production to survive. And, and so this is really where it, it began to lead to subjugation. When we get into the Renaissance and Enlightenment era, um, so... Um, I'm going to talk a bit about how Carolyn, Carolyn Merchant spoke of this and in her book, The Death of Nature. Um, but uh, in the Renaissance era, nature began to be viewed as a machine. And there was this whole I idea of the universe as, as sort of like a clock or a watch that, that like followed, you know, these mechanistic laws. And uh, this is kind of where the idea of, of humans being a tinkerer that could exploit nature came from. And so humans have be began to be able to see nature. Uh, be, they began to be able to see um, themselves as as the masters of nature and, and being able uh, to to master it. Um, I had a Francis Bacon quote. There it is. Okay, now this is a Francis Bacon quote that was really relevant. Um, uh, Francis Bacon said, "Man can recover that right over nature which belongs to it by divine conquest." And uh, Francis Bacon here is referencing the fall of Eden, and so this. This transformative period towards the end of the Renaissance, where we started to get into the Enlightenment, you know, it was influenced by uh, this this sort of merging of the new scientism and and of Genesis and of the, the myth of of the uh, fall of Eden. Um, so this is really where where it came from, and you know, this is where how we've gotten to where we are today. Where this idea that humans can and should subjugate nature has has led us to exploit it. So we we've separated ourselves from nature and elevated ourselves above it as its self-proclaimed masters. Uh, so this is a very authoritarian relationship that has led to a lot of environmental destruction. So it is, it is as a John Bellamy Foster would probably say, to, ferret, to paraphrase, uh, it has justified the robbery of the earth for the sake of production. Um, this is a Carolyn Merchant quote. Uh, she's a fantastic author that wrote extensively about this topic. She said, as Western culture became increasingly mechanized in the 1600s, the female at earth and virgin earth spirit were subdued by the machine, whereas the nurturing earth image can be viewed as a cultural constraint restricting the types of socially and morally sanctioned human actions allowable with respect to the earth. The new images of mastery and domination functioned as cultural sanctions for the denudation of nature. Society needed these new images as it continued the process of commercialism and industrialization, which depend on activities directly altering the earth. Um, so I know I might uh, be starting to sound like a Primmy at this point, and you know, uh, shout out to our Ann Prim comrades, we love you. <laughs> but I'm definitely not a Primmy, and I hope that will become clear. Um, I'm, I'm just like you know trying to uh, like outline where this view, this authoritarian view, and this authoritarian relationship towards nature came from in, in terms of its historical development, and it really goes back way, way deep. And uh, the thing is, you know, as I said. Uh, this is no surprise because the way that we uh, view and treat each other is, is going to be reflected in our attitudes um, and interactions uh, with the rest of the biosphere on this planet. So now as anarchists, you know, again, applying the anarchist critique, we have to ask ourselves, does the position of authority our society has claimed over the rest of the natural world justify itself because we are a part of nature yet we are claiming to be separate from it we are claiming to be its masters and we are claiming that we have the right to exploit it for whatever means we want you know whether you want to critique capitalism and say it's, it's for production 
or whether you want to, or whether you're even like the Soviets and, and you believe that, you know, we should achieve socialism and, and we should achieve a, a socialist utopia by industrializing and increasing production. You know, this, this whole uh, position, this, this authoritarian position over nature really tr transcends uh, different modes of political economy. You know, like this, this, this view has been shared by, by many different kinds of uh, societies throughout the past. You know, it was present in, in the Greeks, it was present in medieval society in some form, it was present during the Renaissance, and, and so in pre-capitalist societies today, and even in uh, many uh, socialist societies. So th this, this view has pervaded many societies throughout history. And so now, like, if this justifies itself, or if it doesn't, what have the consequences been of this view? If not, how can we relate to nature in an anarchist way? And, and so uh, what we have here uh, is a global map of biodiversity loss um, showing the change in species richness. Uh, so, um, and you can see that the greatest loss, losses of biodiversity have been in prime agricultural lands. Uh, you see right there, the Great Plains of the United States, uh, in the Midwest, uh, the, the plains of Europe, um, uh, the, the plains of uh, Northern China and India, and uh, the uh, Sahel region, Southern Africa, uh, parts of Australia, um, places in uh, Southeast Asia that have been subject to extensive deforestation for palm oil, like all of what you are seeing here is, is a result of production um, within our society. This is what has caused this and, and this view has justified it. So I hope it's clear that we shouldn't even need to debate this. Uh, the, like the, this, this authoritarian view of nature has had terrible consequences. And, and because we view nature in this way, it has caused and justified this exploitation. It's continuing to perpetuate it. So uh, this is an aerial shot of deforestation to establish palm oil plantations in Kalimantan, Indonesia. And this is a huge problem in Southeast Asia and is driving uh, extensive environmental damage and loss of the world's most ancient and pristine rainforests. The rainforests of Borneo are 150 million years old and they're just being leveled to grow palm oil because we, we think that, you know, we think that destroying these ecosystems for, for the sake of, of whatever our ends are, I'm not saying we, but like as a society, you know, and, and whoever at, at the top is, is calling the shots here, we like it's thought to be OK, you know, and that, that's the point here. You know, I don't want to blame uh everybody for this like you know I, I think a lot of us would agree that this this is atrocious but it's a, it's what I'm trying to say is is it, it's a part of our modern society um, and uh, what was I gonna say yeah so um and and the other thing that you know this is, is a whole extensive rabbit hole is is how the ethic of preservation is juxtaposed against this where you know we we level all these ecosystems, but set aside a small portion to be nature preserves and where, where nature is not to be touched. You can't touch it at all. All you can do is, is, you know, leave nothing but footprints. And then like, this is a whole uh, contradiction that, that we have within our society where, you know, nature is either destroyed and denuded for the sake of production uh, or it is cordoned off and, you know, uh, so that it could be maintained in a static state when, you know, no ecosystems are static. They exist in a state of, dynamic equilibrium. So it's this hugely contradictory and incoherent view of, of the natural world that, that we have constructed, and um, it is not justified. It cannot be justified within the realm of anarchist ethics. So how can we cr construct an anarchist relationship with nature? Uh, so I wanted to introduce the idea of a land ethic, um, and, and this is a, a concept that has been uh, existing in some form for thousands of years, indigenous societies uh, had land ethics. They 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 had an ethical framework that was oftentimes grounded in their spiritual practices for conducting themselves in relation to to the rest of of the the, the ecosystems that they inhabit. Uh, so a land ethic is an ethical framework for relationships for relations and conduct with the land and terrestrial ecosystems specifically. We're talking about terrestrial ecosystems here. The land ethic is is you know. Kind of specific, you know. We can talk about the Earth in general, and uh, and and uh, having an ethical, uh, mutualistic relation with the Earth in general. This is what Carolyn Merchant uh, would call a partnership ethic. Um, but here we're going to talk about the land ethic, ethic because we're going to talk about agriculture. Uh, so, a land ethic is an ethical framework for relations and conduct with land and terrestrial ecosystems. 
And uh, the modern concept of a Western, uh, the modern Western concept of a land ethic was formulated by American author Aldo Leopold uh, in um, his essay that he published, I believe, uh, in 1949. Uh, so part of the more uh, sort of contemporary environmental movement, um, maybe a more radical strain within the movement, uh, because you know you have a whole spectrum with the environmental movement. You you have you have the the moderate liberals who are just like you know. Yes, we can exploit the earth, but as long as we have a lot of protected areas, it's fine. And you know, then you have people like me where it's like, no, we have to completely reconstruct the way we relate with nature. We have to have an ecological society if we even want our civilization to survive in the first place. Um, and then the indigenous people have understood this for thousands of years, that you have to have an ecological society in order to survive long term. And you know, these indigenous societies have survived for thousands of years and, and lived in harmony with the planet. I mean, there are food forests in Central America and the Amazon rainforest that are still being tended by indigenous peoples to this day, and they've been around for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, so Chief Seattle said that the earth does not belong to man, but man belongs to the earth. All things are connected like the blood which unites one's family. And this is very reflective of the indigenous land ethic and, and the indigenous uh, relationship with the natural world. And, and so let's talk about Aldo Leopold. He was a huge inspiration to me when I was first getting into environmental philosophy because I've been concerned about environmental issues ever since I was a child. You know, I saw what was happening to the rainforests. And, and you know, when I was probably six or seven years old, that's what really, you know, got me to be concerned and, and like really invested in environmentalism and the environmental movement um, is, is seeing this and, and you know, understanding that and grasping it from an early age. And so when I came across all the Leopold's land ethic, I was like, wow, this is great. You know, and, and it does have its limitations, but I think we can map it to anarchism. And that's kind of what part of this presentation is gonna be about, the, the applicability of, of the idea of a land ethic to anarchism. And check the time. Okay, we're, we're doing great on time. So um, Aldo Leopold said, the land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include soils, waters, plants, and animals, or collectively, the land. In short, a land ethic changes the role of Homo sapiens from conqueror of the land community to plain the land community to plain member and citizen of it. It implies respect for his fellow members and also respect for the community as such. So I'm um, uh, Aldo Leopold also says, when we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. And I think Bookchin would agree with this wholeheartedly, the, this statement at least. I'm not sure uh, what he thought about Leopoldian ethics in general, um, but I, I see these, the, this, this idea of, of you know, land as a community to which we belong as being very compatible with an anarchist uh, environmental ethic and an anarchist way of relating to, to the natural world. Um, and so uh, his uh, son, Luna Leopold, also said, rather than interpreting the concept of the land ethic as an indication of disregard for the individual in favor of the species or the ecosystem, my view is quite different. I see the concept of the land ethic as the outgrowth and extension of his deep personal concern for the individual, accepting the idea that the cooperations and competitions in human society are eased and facilitated by concern for others. He saw the same consideration extended to other parts of the ecosystem would tend to add integrity, beauty, and stability to the whole. And, and so sort of arising out of this, if we, if, we take, if we have an anarchist take on this, is the idea of mutual aid with nature. And this is a good basis for our anarchist land ethic. And so this is what I think um, would be features of, a, of an anarchist land ethic. Uh, first of all, non-hierarchy, obviously. You know, we, we believe in you know, critiquing and, and abolishing hierarchies that cannot justify themselves. So... In an anarchist view, humans cannot master nature, nor are we intrinsically superior to other life forms. And so the idea here is mapping the anarchist ethic of non-hierarchy onto the relationship with the land that we live on. We see the land as a community that, that we are a part of. And this leads directly into the second principle I have outlined here, non-duality. The idea that human society is a part of nature, which is treated as a subject. It is treated as a living system that has that has intrinsic value you know that that needs to be respected and treated as as a living system and not as an object that is simply a collection of lesser beings you know because that's really how our society views the natural world right now is something over there you know outside of our little uh, outside of our cities that we have built in the towns that we live in in our farms you know 
um, that uh, that uh, is comprised of lesser beings, and and you know either it should be exploited or should should be cordoned off and preserved, like implying you could even pres preserve ecosystems. That just doesn't make sense when you understand ecology. Um, <laughs> so, and then. Um, and I also wrote, when we view ourselves as part of a greater ecological community, we begin to see the other beings we share the land with as having equal right to it, and non-human communities and human communities in general as having equal right to it. And uh, then uh, the third uh, feature of an anarchist land ethic, I would say, is fair share. And this is something I'm deriving uh, from the ethics of permaculture design. We'll talk briefly about that uh, towards the end of the presentation. So the idea of fair share is, is instead of trying to compete with other life forms and, and trying to domineer them and domineer the land, we must work to share the bounty of the land with other life forms and not hoard it. Um, so, so this egalitarian holistic view of nature that arises from non-hierarchy and non-duality demands an ethic of fair share, uh, demands an ethic of fair share among the inhabitants of the land. Uh, so we, so not only do we need to create a, 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 a habitat for ourselves, a human habitat, our habitat that we create needs to be accessible to other life forms and we need to cooperate with other life forms. And this leads directly into the fourth and like, you know, probably the most anarchist feature in, in terms of like praxis, mutual aid. Human society and the rest of the Earth's biosphere can work together to support each other. And I want to, you know, sort of critique another myth that is present within our society that sort of like applies to the idea of preservation that has become so pervasive within liberal environmentalism, the idea that we should set aside these wilderness preserves that, you know, where nobody, where people leave nothing but footprints is that, you know, we can actually help nature. We can be a team player. We can improve the ecosystems around us through our action and through our creative action and our creative management of the land. So. The anarchist ethic of mutual aid calls us to go beyond simply coexisting with other life forms and begin helping them flourish as much as they help us flourish. So, you know, we'll talk more about what this means in, in practice, but, you know, we, we can create essentially a Garden of Eden. We can recreate Eden as, as Francis Bacon wanted to do, but we can create, we can recreate an Eden where everybody gets to participate, not just us. Well, we're not the mass. We're, we're not the masters. We're not the, the ones who are domineering everybody else and, you know, sort of, um, sort of exploiting everything else, but we're just kind of like facilitators, you know, and we're one of, one of many facilitators, you know, we're not the only facilitators that will be present in, in such a system. Uh, so I wanted to also say uh, that, and this is something that was discussed in the permaculture design course I'm taking, uh, cooperation is a law of nature. The establishment and stability of ecosystems is facilitated by mutualistic relationships. And then this is something that Peter Kropotkin talked about extensively as well, how mutualism and mutual aid is a law of nature. And, you know, honestly, I believe that the modern science of ecology owes so much to Peter Kropotkin and, and his insights and, and how he looked at the, like different organisms throughout the natural world and, and how he saw that they cooperated with one another um, and just... You know, it's it's really something that is so present and we're learning more and more about how extensive and pervasive these mutualistic forms of symbiosis where you have two different species that actually help each other out and provide mutual aid to each other. How common that is. And like literally the, the reestablishment of ecosystems after a disturbance is not possible without mutualism. And when it comes to plants, you know, the, the most um, uh one of the most important families of plants for reestablishing ecosystems are the legumes, the nitrogen fixers. They partner with these bacteria, rhizobia, that are capable of taking nitrogen directly out of the atmosphere. The, the bacteria exchange the nitrogen to the plants in exchange for sugars and proteins that the plants provide to the bacteria to facilitate their growth. It's, it's mutual aid. And without this, the land would stay barren. I, I go out into my garden and, you know, um, we'll talk a bit about my, my garden and what I've done as, as an application of this uh, anarchist land ethic. But, like, it was barren soil. And the, like, one of the only plants that would grow there um, at all is this plant called Burr Medic, um, Medicago Polymorpha. And it is a nitrogen fixer that forms this relationship with the bacteria. Um, 
So let's talk about industrialized agriculture then, the way that we produce our food. Like, you know, this is a direct reflection of this authoritarian relationship that we have constructed with the rest of the biosphere. Uh, so I wanted to note that agriculture produces 23% of all greenhouse gas emissions. This is almost as much as the energy sector. When we talk about climate change, you know, like oftentimes it's like, you know, we need to stop burning fossil fuels. We need to, we need to, you know, stop cutting down forests, which reduces greenhouse gas emissions. We need to, you know, we need to, to switch to green energy and like, yes, we need to do that. But people don't talk about agriculture and, and like how big of an impact it has and in like the way that we practice it. Uh, so these emissions come from habitat destruction, first of all. Uh, so, you know, again, looking back at that map that I showed you of uh, that, that I showed you all of um, uh, biodiversity loss, you know, like we'll, we'll go back really quick. Like all these places you see with the highest biodiversity loss, most of them are prime agricultural land or the grasslands it's where the food is being grown on our planet, you know. And so the, like, you know, this is no coincidence. Um, so the land is cleared um, a way to, to make for factory farms. And like, you know, what are you doing when you clear land? You know, when you burn a forest or cut down a forest or, you know, uh, destroy a prairie, you know, and, and you know, you're, you're setting back the clock of ecological succession. That is the uh, progression of ecosystems. And, and what do you get when you do that? You get weeds. You get these plants that try to reestablish the ecosystem. And we call these plants weeds. And then what do we do? You know, or what then what does industrial agriculture do? I don't want to keep referring to we. Uh, that's, you know, it's, we we don't have you and I and you, or me, me and me and you all. We don't really have much of a hand in this, do we? Um, you know, we're, we're not deciding how the land is managed, you know, in, in these big industrial farms. But then what is done, I should say. This land is planted with a single crop, a monoculture. So the, 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 the fields are planted with a single crop intended to buy machines. Now, is, is a monoculture something you really see in, in a healthy ecosystem? No way. Absolutely not. So this, this is an unstable state for an ecosystem to have a monoculture because a farmland is an ecosystem, you know, whether we want to view it as one or not. And again, you know, like this whole idea that, you know, when, when humans touch nature, it becomes unnatural. That's a myth. It's a total myth. And, and we can see that, you know, because when we have a mechanized monoculture, what comes back to, to try and reset the ecosystem? The weeds come back. The pests come in because, you know, what are pests? You know, they, they pests in, in, um, in, in ecosystems, they deal with the overpopulation of a single organism. They're, the crops that, that are being grown in these fields, it's, it's overpopulation. Like they're, they're consuming too many resources. You know, and then obviously, you know, I'm, I'm not going to talk about overpopulation, how it applies to humans. That is a whole other conversation. And I'm not saying the world is overpopulated, but the, the fields that, that are, are, are certainly overpopulated with corn are certainly overpopulated with soybeans and, and wheat, you know, and uh, whatever else is, is being grown on these thousand acre tracts of, of land, this single crop, you know, and so the, the weeds and the pests come in to try and restore the balance because we like this. This artificially unbalanced ecosystem has been created. You're working against entropy when you do this. So, so then the weeds and the pests come in even more. When you destroy the habitat, weeds and pests come in. You know, weeds and pests. When you plant a monoculture, weeds and pests come in. And also when you plant a monoculture, you, uh, you deplete the soil. So you deplete the soil when you plant a monoculture, then what? You know, you have to apply fertilizer to, to return the nutrients to the soil because the, the nutrients aren't being returned to the soil by the crop. You know, the, the crops are harvested, the nutrients are go, going out of the soil and, and the residues are burned or, or, you know, trashed or whatever. And, um, and like, especially the nitrogen is, is depleted from the soil. Um, so, so then what do we do? Like, or what, what is done? I, again, I should say petrochemical fertilizers are applied to the field. And you know what that's a picture of? That is a tanker full of anhydrous ammonia. Literally, anhydrous ammonia is sprayed onto these fields. What does that do to all the organisms that inhabit the soil and facilitate the proper cycling and availability of nutrients when you spray literally like cleaner onto the soil? A, a, a chemical that is used <laughs> to disinfect and clean things. What does that do? It kills them all. They're dead. All of the organisms that 
kept the soil healthy and allowed and allowed plants to thrive there have been killed now. And so now you've gotten your plants hooked on this chemical. It's like getting them hooked on drugs. So you have to keep applying more and more fertilizers. And, and these fertilizers, these chemical fertilizers are applied because they promote the standardization of yields and standardization. And how do you think these fertilizers are produced? These nitrogenous fertilizers, ammonia, um, ammonium nitrate. They're made from fossil fuels. They're made from oil through the Haber-Bosch process. So like not only is our energy sector dependent on fossil fuels, but the agricultural sector is too. Like we're, we're literally spraying petroleum products onto the fields or petroleum products are literally being sprayed onto the fields. Um, so, and it kills all, all the organisms. And so we're turning back the clock of succession even more. Now, now we don't even have soil, we have dirt, it's dead. You know, with maybe some bacteria in it, because really only the back some bacteria can survive this. You know, all the all the fungi that support, you know, many of the crops that you want to grow, because you need to have fungi in the soil, the, the mycorrhizal fungi and the decomposers, they're dead. You know, the, the, the ammonia kills them. So then what? You know, all some organisms start trying to come back. You know, the, the weeds that like to grow with the bacteria try to grow, come back even more. So more weeds, you know, the, then the application of these fertilizers, you know, because it destroys the soil health, the plants end up becoming weaker because they don't have all these soil organisms to protect them from diseases. So now what? Pesticides. So now we make the problem. So now the problem is, is to be made worse. So this kills off the soil organisms even more. And it becomes a vicious cycle where you have to keep applying fertilizer, these synthetic fertilizers and keep applying these toxic pesticides just to maintain yields. And you have to use more and more of them and then use stronger and stronger pesticides. And so, and this, this is just like insanity. Like it's, it's destroying the land, it's destroying the water, it's destroying the air. And, and like, again, the, a lot of the excess fertilizer that remains on the fields, it either gets washed into the rivers, causing algae blooms in, in like, we're in like the, the Gulf of Mexico, right off of the, the, the coast of Louisiana, this, the size of, of the state of Massachusetts, and the rest of it goes into the air as, as nitrous oxide, a greenhouse gas that is 230 times more potent than carbon dioxide. 230 times. And then now, because all this is happening, we only have 60 years of topsoil left because all of this, with no biology to hold the soil in place, the soil is just washing away. It's blowing away and it's washing away. And in 60 years, we won't be able to grow food in it. There will be no soil. It'll, it'll be like it'll be like impossible or extremely difficult to grow things in it you know and so we're, we're looking at a doomsday clock right here this is a doomsday clock that people oftentimes don't talk about or don't know about 60 years and that's on top of all the other ecological problems we're facing so not only will climate change make agriculture a lot more difficult in prime agricultural lands but the topsoil is, is being destroyed we won't have any more. So this has to change. This has to change. So um, all of these practices have the effect of destroying the soil structure and, and, you know, and polluting the air, the water and the soil, you know, we're, and, and our food that we're eating. We're putting this food that is being grown this way into our mouths, into our bodies. What effects is that having? Like who knows what kinds of pesticides are being used? Like these don't get tested adequately. Many of them probably aren't even tested. You know, there, there's been this whole effort in the state of California where I live to ban this pesticide that is used on like fruit trees and almond trees called chlorpyrifos. And it's, it's a neurodevelopmental toxin. Like its effects are very similar to lead when, it's, when, when babies are exposed to it in the womb, when fetuses are exposed to it. And like, this is being sprayed onto the fields. It's being sprayed everywhere. All of this crap. And that's getting into our bodies like this. It's hurting us directly, too. So um, th this cannot continue. So like we have to really think here, you know, like what can we do? Like people like because this is the norm, like, you know, the, again, you know, many people are under the impression like, you know, I've seen people say this. Oh, like, you know, feeding the world is impossible without this industrial system of agriculture. It can't happen. You know, it's, it's, it's impossible. You, you have to use synthetic fertilizers. You have to use these toxic pesticides to, to, to feed the growing population. And, you know, I'm here to tell you that's bullshit. It's total bullshit. 
you know, like it's, it's, it's fucking bullshit, you know? And then what's even more bullshit is the idea of, of over the world being overpopulated because with this system, you know, we currently produce enough food to feed 10 billion people and we could easily produce more because the, the methods I'm about to talk about per literally produce more food like than we're, than is being produced industrially, like per unit of, per unit of land, more calories are literally being, literally can be produced this way. So the question is then what if we can heal the land as we farm instead of destroying it? And yes, we can. Like people think, you know, this is too good to be true. Like, you know, agriculture has destroyed, you know, the environment, you know, ever since it became a thing. And it's like, no, 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 no. Agriculture has, is not the problem here. It's, it's the way that it is being practiced right now and has been practiced throughout many societies. Like, you know, it's thought that the fall of the Roman Empire was caused by uh, improper agricultural practices, the Mayan Empire, like, you know, a lot of, this is a pattern throughout history. When you have these big empires that develop, you know, and, and become very authoritarian, the land becomes treated in an authoritarian way, and then the soil is exhausted, and, and the empires can't feed themselves, and they collapse. Like, this is a trend throughout history. So we need something better. And then this is when we're going to talk about regenerative agriculture as the application of an anarchist land ethic. So regenerative agriculture creates the conditions for soil regeneration and therefore heals the land and restores biodiversity. All regenerative agriculture does is replicate ecological succession. The process that I just talked about that all of industrialized agriculture has to constantly fight against because it destroys the environment, has to constantly fight against. We're, we're going to work with it instead. We're going we're gonna to understand that process. We're going to work with it. We're going to use it to heal the land. We're going to use it to bring back biodiversity and grow an abundance of food. And so all regener regenerative agriculture does is, is replicate that process. And um, so this this project, that uh, I call it the Resilience Garden Project. It's cataloged on my channel. So you can see in March 2020, you know, there's my aquaponic system in the back. The land right there is barren. Like, you know, you have moss growing on it. Like, it's just dirt. Like, it's it's like cement. It's like cement. You know, it's, it's you can't. I can't even, I couldn't even get through it with a shovel, you know, like I, I had to use like to like get through it. I had to use like literally this 20 pound iron digging bar and the soil had been left uncovered and exposed to the elements for years. And so it just kind of died, you know? Um, so, so I, I saw this land, you know, especially in, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic and, you know, the, the pandemic happened. So I was just like, shit, you know, I have to know how to grow food in the, in the soil, you know, cause I've been doing aquaponics for all these years. I know a thing or two about soil, but I, I really have to, buckle down and then learn how to grow food in the ground, you know, because, you know, all of you know, like can see as anarchists where our civilization is headed, you know, in terms of like, like politically, you know, that's like, you know, the major topic within anarchism is like the rise of fascism and authoritarianism and it's getting worse and worse and worse. And, and, you know, the, the, the governments and the corporations are trying to control us more and more and more and more. And, and, and soon like, you know, like, and like the way that we resist this is by growing food, by growing our own food, like by not being dependent on them, you know? So I, I realize, you know, I, I need to reduce my dependence on, on this system. I need to, and I need to know how to not be dependent on it. If shit goes, if shit goes to hell. And I need to know how to take a, a patch of barren dirt and turn it into living soil. And that's exactly what I did. You can see in December, how different that soil looks. And then like in September, how even in the first season, like I was surprised by how much the garden was thriving. Um, it's, it was incredible really. And regenerative agriculture, it, it's like you, you see the results and it's like happening in front of your eyes and it, it feels like a miracle, like a legitimate miracle. So, and, and it is like basically, and you know, this is a large scale regenerative agriculture project in, in the Lust Plateau in China. Like an entire ecosystem was, turned from a desert back into like a, a prairie and, and forests, like in the course of like a decade or so. Um, and it's amazing what we can be done. And, and see this, this is the quote that I feel really hits home. Um, Jeff Lawton, uh, the permaculture teacher said, we can be the most beneficial element on earth instead of the most damaging. And, and that is so, so pertinent and people really need to understand that. And like, you know, I, I feel like if, if as anarchists, we, we take that to heart, you know, not only can we, regenerate the earth from, you know, all this destruction that is being caused by our, our modern industrial civilization. And, and we can, you know, through an anarchist system of agriculture an anarchist land ethic and an anarchist politic, we can heal the earth. 
We really can't. So I highly recommend this film that's on YouTube for free. It's called Regretting the Desert with John D. Liu. And then like I, I watched this and I, I watched this, you know, knowing about all these principles. And I was like, I was floored. I was floored by like this project and how successful it was and, and like the results. It, it was just, it blew my mind. And like, you know, I, I highly recommend you watch it. It's incredible. Um, so, and here's the other thing. Regenerative agriculture can sequester over 100% of annual CO2 emissions or greenhouse gas emissions, not CO2, not just CO2. Um, and do this while healing the land, while improving our soils, while restoring biodiversity, while healing ecosystems. It all could be done. We can do it. It's, it's just changing the way that the land is, is cultivated. That's all it is. It's amazing. It's the simplest solution ever. Like people talk about... Like a lot of these, you know, the fossil fuel lobby especially talks about, oh, we need to do, do carbon capture and sequestration in the ground. We make these big factories that pump all the CO2, to liquefy the CO2 and pump it in the ground. It's like, no, it's bullshit. We don't need to do that. We just need to change the way we manage the land. That's it. And and obviously, you know, cut our emissions, you know, because we, we should do that at the same time. But like, you know, we need to go the other direction too. And this is how we go the other direction. Not by building these fucking factories to put the, to put the CO2 back in the ground. It's bullshit. No, it's, it's a waste. This is what we do. Um, so I'm not kidding. Like this, this is research. Like this is known. The Redale Institute did a whole white paper on it, a whole paper. Like it's that references all this peer reviewed literature. It's, it could be done. The Rodale Institute is one of the most respected institutions that promotes organic farming in the world. And, and they're all, it's, it's all science and research based. Their whole mission is to research organic techniques and regenerative techniques. And, and they put out this paper. I highly recommend you read it. You can get it online for free. Um, it's like, a, I don't want to say like 40 pages. It's worth, if you're really interested in, in learning more about this and, and it's, its benefits, I, I, I would really recommend reading this. And I'll have uh, more free resources, a list of more free resources uh, available um, at the end of the presentation. Uh, so definitely check this out. Um, and uh, so by combining regenerative cropping, so like actually cultivating lands to grow crops, and this is the other one that's big, regenerative grazing, you know, changing the way we graze the land with livestock because livestock are, I mean, grazing animals are a part of grassland ecosystems. If we replicate how, they graze in grassland ecosystems, and this is something that Alan Savory understood. Check out Alan Savory and his work. And um, there's this whole regenerative grazing movement now, and it's it's really starting to gain traction. And you know there have been studies done on this. Like you can literally sequester carbon by by changing the way cattle are grazed. You know, and the potential is massive. Like all this land that was destroyed, like all that land, we can heal it just by changing the way that we manage it. That's all. Uh, so let, let's, let's talk about, uh, the seven tendencies towards regeneration on uh, the Rodale Institute. Um, so, um, pluralism, increase the diversity of plant, animal, microbe, and fungus species. So increase the diversity of life on your farm uh, or in your garden, um, protection, keep the soil covered to conserve moisture and protect soil organisms because in ecosystems, the soil is always covered. If you have barren soil, it's going to get colonized by weeds. That's just what's going to happen. Daddy. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk, buddy. If you if you have barren soil, that's when the weeds move in, Be, because because you know Mother Nature or whoever you want to talk about it, she wants to cover the soil, you know, or you know they or whatever. Like Mother Nature or nature wants to cover the soil uh, because exposed soil is going to erode. So the, the weeds are adapted to these conditions and they will come in and cover the soil and begin regenerating it. So um, we, want to, we want to learn from that. We want to replicate it. We want to cover the soil. And we'll talk about how to do that. Um, so purity, and I, I don't like this term. I don't like the, the word purity, but this is the word they use because pure, the, the term purity, when, when used in the context of, of like, um, of like a agriculture, of like environmentalism, uh, can have uh, very eco-fascist implications. <laughs> so um, I don't like, I, I want to make that clear. I don't like that term, but I like the principle. So refrain, refrain from using toxic agrochemicals and damaging the environment. Uh, so that's very important because it's, it's those, it's that environmental damage that comes from using those synthetics that, you know, turn back, back the clock of succession and damage the land. 
uh, permanence and emphasis on perennial plants and cultivation systems where possible. Uh, so, and again, ecological succession, you know, you start out with your annual weeds, your, your perennial grasses, and then, and then your, your, your bushes and, and your brush, and then it goes to forest. That's the ecological succession. If, if you, you have enough rainfall to, to have a forest, of course, it, it might. Here in, in California, uh, the, in much of California, the, it, the successional clock stops at what's called um, uh, stops at what's called a chaparral ecosystem or a sage scrub ecosystem, which is like um, uh, it's it's just like shrubland, or it might stop at a uh, perennial grassland in, in some places. Um, and then uh, the the clock is set back naturally by fire, like it's a whole cycle. Succession is is cyclical; it's not linear. Like it's oftentimes taught as as linear as a linear process within ecology, but that's also a product of <laughs> this whole ideology of, of nature is supposed to be un, untouched or whatever. Um, and it, it's really cyclical. Like disturbances happen. You know, we just have to understand how to manage disturbance. Peace. Use agroecology techniques to disrupt pest outbreaks and weather natural disasters. So instead of you know trying to kill all the pests, you know, uh, with with the pesticides or whatever, you know, that's that's not we have to understand what's causing the pests, the pest outbreaks to happen. We need to understand what's causing the pest outbreaks to happen. We need to understand what's causing the weeds to grow. And what that is, is it's a deficiency in the ecosystem. So we use agroecology, we use ecology applied to agriculture to create a sustainable and stable farmland ecosystem or ranch ecosystem that exists in a state of dynamic equilibrium so that the conditions are unfavorable for the weeds and the pests. And so that the ecosystem is stable and can weather natural disasters and it can adapt because it totally can. You know, the, the, our industrial system, it's, it's not stable at all. It can't adapt. You know, we, the more drastic the environmental structure, stressors become, the, the harder it is to maintain the system. And eventually we're going to get to a point where it just collapses and, and, and we'll have food shortages. It's just going to happen. And so we need to change the system of agriculture so that it can actually be resilient in the face of, of these disasters in the face of climate change and then potential. So focus on increasing the potential of the soil to support healthy plants. Just feed the soil, not the plants. This is the mantra that's repeated in regenerative agriculture and even in organic agriculture, feed the soil, not the plants. You know, we're plants are a product. They're a consequence of healthy soil. Your food that you're growing is a consequence of healthy soil, not the other way around. You're not trying to, Make the soil. You're not trying to, you know, uh, cultivate the soil just to grow food. You, you're you're trying to manage the soil so that food is produced as a result. Then progress with proper management yields and efficiency increase over time because it's regenerative, or even generative. The the system improves over time. It goes through the process of ecological succession. It becomes more productive, more stable, more resilient, and more biodiverse. And, and, you know, more inviting to, you know, your local wildlife. It was amazing. Like this summer, like, you know, um, I saw a garter snake in my garden. I found a garter snake. I've never seen a garter snake here ever. I've never seen a garter snake in my backyard ever. And then I go up there, I heal the soil, I plant this garden. We've got a garter snake. And the garter snake is now controlling the pests. It's controlling the pests. So now you're inviting in the predators that keep the pests in check. And this is how it's done. You know, you create a stable ecosystem, a self-regulating ecosystem, because the industrial monocultures, it's, they're completely incapable of self-regulating. If you build a self-regulating system, you invite in your, your local ecology, then you won't have pests, you won't have weeds, you know, or, you, there will, or you'll have some, but they won't be a problem. I've never sprayed a, sprayed a single drop of pesticides in my garden, a single drop ever. And... Now I have all these predators that are taking care of the pests for me, you know? So let's be more specific. So you ask me, Mr. Solar Punk Farm, can you be more specific? You know, you've been talking about all these things. It's like so general and abstract. So like, how do I do it? You know, what do I do? You know, you showed me these amazing pictures of what you did to your soil. You know, what, what happened? How did you do it? Okay, four things. Soil microbiome maintenance. So introduce and maintain soil organism populations. Uh, with high quality compost and inoculums. I'm a huge fan of composting. If you can compost, please compost. You know, people say, people like to think, you know, even in the gardening world, in the organic gardening world, oh, I make compost to fertilize my plants. Okay, great. You know, yes, compost contains nutrients, but, you know, that's not really the point. Compost is not a fertilizer, it's an inoculum. It is a cross section of, of your soil community, your soil food web. 
And then, you know, when you compost, you, when you introduce compost to barren soil, you're introducing soil biology. That's what you're doing. And that's why it's important to have high quality compost. And uh, you can also use compost to, to make these uh, other products or, you know, concoctions that you apply to your soil. I have various recipes, um, but like compost tea is a big one. Uh, there's another one that you could use called compost extract. I also practice vermicomposting. Uh, where you will actually construct a habitat for a, a specific species of uh, uh, earthworm called uh, um, uh, red wigglers and, and then you put your food scraps in there and then like shredded paper and then leaves and stuff and they break it down for you and it produces some of the highest quality compost ever. Uh, so you're, you're creating, you know, your, your compost pile, your worm farm, that is your living inoculum for your soil. That is where your all of your it's like this, the point where you centralize all of your soil biology or much of it. The decomposers, at least. There, there's another kind of another class of soil organisms called mutualists, which are like a your mycorrhizal fungi. If you've ever, if any of you are in the cannabis world, then you've probably heard of mycorrhizal fungi and maybe even use them. But mycorrhizal fungi are like ubiquitous throughout nature, and they support plants. So another example of mutualists would be uh, your rhizobia. I talked about earlier, nitrogen fixing bacteria partner with plants and then those can't be those can't survive in compost you have to there are other method, methods for getting those in but you know we'll, we'll i'll be covering that on my youtube channel you know so subscribe please <laughs> um then um let, let's let's talk about uh polyculture so intercropping you know like people in the gardening world talk about companion planting and then the way they look at it is like oh you know i'm, I'm growing all this lettuce right and i'm going to plant marigolds to keep the pests away and it's like you know the purpose of the marigolds you know shouldn't be just to keep the pests away it should be a component of your ecosystem. It should be, you should be trying to construct an ecosystem, not just, I want to grow this crop and that crop and then these big, you know, these rows, these big blocks and, you know, um, have it be all neat and organized and I'll just plant these couple plants to, to keep the pests away. No, it's not how the right way to think about it, in my opinion. Um, so instead it's like, oh, let's, let's, let's make a plant community. Let's make a community of, of plants, you know, an ecosystem of edible plants and useful plants, you know, we can create these ecosystems, these these polycultures, these guilds, as they call them in permaculture, especially when you're talking about uh, food forestry, you know, with, with fruit trees and nut trees. Need these guilds, you know, of, of plants that all work together and, and support each other. Mutual aid. These plants that you, you, you make construct, you make these assemblages of plants that practice mutual aid with one another. That's what polyculture is. That's the right way to think about it. So, um, yeah, very important, polyculture. Um, mulching. Mulching is just referring to covering the soil. Like if you're familiar with the term mulching in the landscaping industry, it's like, oh, we're going to lay down wood chips to, you know, keep water in the soil and, you know, or, or tree bark or whatever, these dyed wood chips. And, you know, it's, it's like, it's going to help conserve moisture if you live in a drought prone climate or you don't get a lot of rain. It's like, yes, it's true. It conserves moisture. That's one of the benefits. And, you know, but what really what it does is, you know, it keeps the soil covered because again, in functional ecosystems, the soil is always covered. You know, all these principles, you know, this is how we learn. These, these, these principles come directly from what we have learned from how stable ecosystems function and how, and, and we want to replicate that in, in our farms and in our gardens. So that's, that's where this comes from. Uh, so um, mulching. Uh, so protects soil organisms, prevents erosion, suppresses weeds, and conserves moisture. Uh, so um, you can cover it. So a mulch is just like an organic material, either living or dead, that you cover your soil with. You can use wood chips. I use wood chips in my garden. I use I love wood chips. They're a fantastic mulch. Um, I use uh, uh, fallen leaves from like all the deciduous trees around here. Shred, it's good to shred them up um, if you can. Uh, and, and you're just you're creating that that forest or grassland floor environment. That's what you're doing, you know? You're creating an environment that is present in functional ecosystems. The, the, the ground layer that, that is covered with plant material. And so you can use the dead mulches, like the, the leaves and the wood chips, or you can use a living mulch, a cover crop. So a cover crop, well, what is a cover crop? It's a mixture of weeds that you create. You engineer the weed mixture, you create a community of weeds of weedy plants that again practice mutual aid from one another that benefit from one another and you sow it in your garden and it restores the soil it's a cover crop 
Um, an integrated pest management. So model functional ecosystem to create conditions unfavorable to pests. So here's an example. You know, I'm a, lots of plants in the carrot family. Um, Apiacea, I think. Um, they make these umbraliferous flowers. You know, like if you've ever seen a carrot's flower or Queen Anne's lace or yarrow, same family. And these flowers attract parasitoid wasps. What do parasitoid wasps do? You know those cabbage worms, the, those uh, those cabbage worms that have been eating your your cabbage and, and your lettuce. You know, they go up to the cabbage worms, they lay their eggs inside of the cabbage worms. The eggs, the larvae hatch, parasitize the worm, eat it out from the inside, and it dies. There's your pest control. Your pesticide is the wasp. So you can plant plants like that to attract the predators. And some other plants, you know, they, they might um, exude aromatic compounds that repel other pests. Uh, like, for example, um, marigolds do that. Uh, marigolds also secrete compounds into the soil that um, suppress uh, parasitic uh, nematodes, like these little uh, worms, that worm thingies that live in the soil that parasitize plant roots. And if you plant marigolds, it'll suppress them. So you can include marigolds into your uh, polyculture as well. And of course, marigold flowers you can eat. You know, these plants serve multitude of functions. And then, of course, you know, going back to the microbiome, like, you know, managing your microbiome is a part of integrated pest management, maintaining healthy soil with a good soil food web. Because if you have healthy soil with a good community of soil organisms, with a diverse community, then the pests won't be able to survive. All the, all the good guys will outcompete them. Same thing in your garden with your plants, you know, and then like your beneficial animals and insects, you know. The, the, you know, the mice that come and, and, and the bugs that come and eat your plants won't be able to survive the, the beetles, you know, because, because the garter snake that I just attracted to my garden by healing the land and by creating habitat for it. That's another thing. Create the habitat for, for the beneficials, the predators. It's eating the pests now. So that's integrated pest management. Like not really relying on pesticides or, you know, constructing these ecological relations that, you know, and introducing, you know, organisms that keep the pest populations in check. And you will have some pests and that's okay. Our, our farms do not, our gardens do not have to be sterile and completely free of pests. That's not the point. You know, they have a role to play. That the role of these pest organisms in nature is, is to, is to take out the, the plants that are weak, the ones that are struggling and that, then that, you know, are, that are, um, uh, that are consuming, that are, that are consuming resources that could be made available to stronger plants. That's what they're for. It's self-regulation. Pests are a part of the self-regulation of ecosystems. So let's let's talk about what I did. Okay. Um, so site prep. This is the site. Um, I amended with free compost from the city uh, since my soil was that bad. Um, you can do this without amending. Totally can. But if you have really bad soil like me, use good quality compost. The compost I used wasn't that great. It set me back uh, maybe like two months because of that. And my plants didn't get going until I introduced some more good biology. But, um, you know... I did this by hand. It, it was a ton of work, took a long time. Use a rototiller. So I basically just dug these beds uh, like 12 inches down and then uh, um, backfilled uh, with, you see the mounds of soil right there. I, I backfilled the soil with, with a bunch of compost uh, that I got for free from the city. I did most of this for free. You can do this for free. That's the other thing we'll talk about. This, this is dirt cheap. You don't have to spend a lot of money to do regenerative agriculture. You don't have to buy all these stupid products that they sell in the garden stores. and They're useless. Um, um, so yeah, and just, yeah, use a rototiller if you can get a hold of one. Like, you know, I, I really regret not using the rototiller. Um, I could have rented one, but I, I don't have one, you know? Um, and you generally, part of it is like, you know, another principle that I didn't really mention here is, is you don't want to disturb the soil really, uh, by like tilling it because that, that rips up all of the, uh, that rips up and kills all of the beneficial organisms. But my soil was dead already. So it's like, okay, I want to get compost in there. I want to get some organic matter in there because, Organic matter, which is like, you know, decayed remains of, of all your, of all the life forms that live in the soil and still on top of the soil. That's like the basis of healthy soil. Like, you know, um, so I wanted to get some of that in there because the soil was basically dead. Like nothing would grow in it pretty much. So except for a, a few stragglers here and there. So I wanted to get some compost in there to improve that situation. Um, and then what I, and then, you know, I mulched over and, and those things that you see in the center are oyas. Um, that's an ancient, um, Irrigation technique that originated in Africa and China 4,000 years ago using clay pots. 
Super cool. I did a whole video of that on my channel. You should check it out. Uh, so then I amended with free compost from the city. Yeah, I said that already. So that's what the beds look like after. So before, after. See my wildflowers in the strip? Wildflower strip in the back right there. Again, like, you know, that's a, uh, I'll use my pointer. I forgot there's a pointer on Google Slides. <laughs> yeah, these are, these are my, this is my wildflower buffer, buffer strip to attra attract pollinators and predators. You know, because here we have the monoculture lawn, you know, that, that gets the chemical fertilizers, you know, and then we have the, the protective strip, you know, so if, if the predators try and come in from here and then, you know, they hit this and like, oh, I mean, if the pests come in from here, like, you know, they hit this is like, oh, here are your predators, you know, you are now going to get eaten. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I, I mulched over afterwards. Uh, this was back in March, um, March, April, and then I installed the Oyas and, uh, Three other methods I use from here, uh, compost tea. Uh, so your compost tea are your uh, microbial brews containing beneficial soil biology and, nut and some nutrients to kickstart the soil food web. It's like, you know, in, in this case, again, the nutrients are really to feed the soil. Like your soil will have many of the nutrients, especially the, the micronutrients and then like the, the mineral nutrients it needs to support plants. Most soils have all those nutrients. It's just a matter of mobilizing them. And, and how do you mobilize the nutrients? How do you get those nutrients to cycle through the system? You introduce the biology that actually mines the nutrients out of the little fragments of rock and dust in the soil and, and incorporates them into their bodies in organic form and then in, our, in, our, in organic form. And then, you know, the, the little bugs in the soil come along and eat them and then release the nutrients so the plants can take them up and the plants take up the nutrients and then the plants grow and die. The nutrients turn to the soil. It's, it's a whole cycle. And once you get the biology going, you know, in the soil that kickstarts the whole process. Once you get biology and, and living roots in the soil that kickstarts the process. Um, um, and uh, so compost tea, uh, um, so basically in compost, the beneficial microbes and, and fungi like live on this kind of like, especially the bacteria, they live on like this microfilm on, on the surface of like the, the individual like aggregate particles in the compost. And so really what you're doing in the compost tea is, is you're, you're essentially, just you're putting the compost inside, you know, a bucket of water, you know, dechlorinated water. Make sure to use dechlorinated water. I like to use aquaponic water since it contains trace nutrients and some more biology. And uh, then, you know, they're now suspended in the water. And then what you do is you introduce a food source. Uh, so I like to use unsulfured blackstrap molasses. And so you've given them all this food. You can also use humic acids. Uh, that's supposed to support the, the growth of fungi more because the bacteria like the sugars and the, the fungi apparently like the humic acids. Um, but so you, you put all the microbes and the fungi in there and then all the good stuff in there and you give it all this food you give them all this food. And then, and then over the course of 20 of 24 to 72 hours, depending on the temperature and, and how long you want to let the brew grow, let the brew go, depending on your technique or whatever, or in your recipe, like, you know, you're, you're multiplying them. You, so you you only need a little bit of, of your compost or your vermicompost and you you multiply them out and, and you have this microbe soup and then you apply that to your soil uh, to um, introduce the organisms. You can spray it on your plants uh, to protect them from uh, harmful uh, uh, bacteria and fungi uh, to create like a barrier on, on the on the surfaces of the plants. Um, and uh, compost is just a great thing to use uh, to get the biology going. Um, then uh, what I uh, have been doing is called sheet composting. I just released a video on this. You could, you should check it out, explaining the whole process, how I got all the stuff I use for the sheet compost for free. And then this is like, you know, this is replicating the leaf litter in a forest, you know, uh, getting all these organic m materials onto the soil and then like, but speeding, but in a way where you speed up the process. So you speed up the process by including green materials and because green materials have lots of nitrogen and the nitrogen um, is incorporated is, is used by the bacteria and fungi to produce en the enzymes they need to actually break down all the material. So you essentially put alternating layers of, of green material and brown material on top of the soil, and then it composts in place. You know, you're building like a, a sheet compost, like li literally what it is, and it builds topsoil, uh, like the like the humus. You know, the humic layer, the the O horizon, as they say in uh, soil science, um, soil morphology, the, the O horizon. You're seventh grade soil morphology class or whatever, you know, that my, one of my favorite people, Larry Santoyo likes to talk about. <laughs> um, yeah, so that compost in place builds topsoil, uh, then your cover crops. So your cover crops are your living roots. They're your 
engineered weed mixture. So it's a mixture of plants that mobilizes the nutrients. It helps the microbes and the fungi mobilize the nutrients and get them into the system. It improve they improve the soil structure because their roots penetrate into the soil. Um, and then when the plants die, the, the roots compost in place and you know it improves the structure of the soil because you're you're so now you're composting underneath the soil when you use your cover crops. You're you're, you're making more green material on top and then the roots are composting underneath. So um, and then the roots also put out these compounds, these exudate, exudates, it's like, you know, sugars, proteins, um, and carbohydrates. So like what we like to eat, sugars, proteins, and carbohydrates. And, and uh, um, that stimulates the biology even more, the biology that you just added from the compost team. Um, and then the sheet compost built the topsoil that you need, that you really, that the cover crops would really benefit from, especially if you are using later succession cover crops that, that are more aggressive. Um, and, and then, uh, then the cover crops stimulate the biology. So now you've gotten your system going. Simple as that, you know, like these three techniques that you can do for very cheaply, produce your own compost to make compost tea, get the sheet compost materials for free and buy the cover crop seeds for really cheaply, uh, just water them and watch them grow. And for the most part, they don't really need fertilizer. If your soil is bad as mine, I would add some fertilizer unless you're using legumes, uh, your nitrogen fixers. Um, they, they, in my experience, it doesn't look like they really need it in my soil. You know, I, I, I'm growing those ones out of like almost completely untreated soil. I, I added a light sprinkling of compost just to introduce some organic matter and biology over this. This is in the soil around the garden beds. Um, and then uh, I uh, just uh, added some compost tea. And I fertilized once because the, I, I put some uh, uh, tillage radish in there like uh, and some daikon radish. Those are used in cover crop mixes, daikon radish. Um, um, and they were struggling a bit because there wasn't enough nitrogen in the system let yet. So I'm like, okay, I'll just give them some nitrogen and you know, they've been looking a little better. Uh, but the, uh, the, the clovers and the hairy vetch that I included in the mix, they produce their own nitrogen from the rhizobia. Like the, they partner with the rhizobia to, to fix nitrogen. So they don't need fertilizer really. Um, and then you can do this. It's dirt cheap. So easy. Like your costs are really limited to your seeds. And then like, you might need some small amounts of organic fertilizer to get everything going. You'll need some tools, you know, like, you know, I like the idea of a tool of a tool library. This is something our anarchists, our anarchists can do is like make a tool, like get together with your friends, like pool together your tools and have a tool library so that you all can garden, you know, just borrow, check out tools from the tool library and bring them back. You know, um, I love that idea. And I'm, I'm going to look at, I'm looking into starting one here eventually, you know, like all my friends, you know, are all spread out across the Los Angeles area. So it's a bit more difficult, but um, you know, I don't have a lot of local friends per se. I'm kind of in a weird part of the city. Uh, but this is something I'm looking into starting, especially as, as some of my friends get into gardening more. It's like, yeah, like, let's make a tool library. I have a wood chipper. I have a sawzall, a reciprocating saw. I have all these tools. Like, you know, if, if you need to, you know, borrow tools, just check it out and, you know, bring it back to me. We'll agree when we'll agree upon, you know, a time frame. And if you need more time, just let me know. Just let me know in advance. You know, like it's just mutual aid. It's so simple. Like, you know, <laughs> It's, it's just like, you know, helping each other out and then helping each other grow food, like lending each other tools. And, you know, when my other friends get tools like, oh, you know, you have this tool. Can I borrow it? Um, or literally the other day I went to my friend's house because he had um, what did I? he had a router. I don't have a router. And I was I was, I was building um, this uh, this press to make hay bales uh, for for a, for, a, for my permaculture design course that I'm taking. Um, and uh and, and like, just, I just went over to his house and he helped me route out this, this piece that we needed for it. And, you know, just like, you know, you just need a network of people who have tools and you can do this, you know, and then transportation for materials. Like if you need to bring in compost, like it's good for somebody in your group to have like a car or a truck. And, and so you can go to the, the, the compost yard, pick up some compost, go to the store, do whatever. But like, you know, it's so cheap. And then of course you just need land. And, you know, I believe in gorilla gardening. I love gorilla gardening. I'm doing a gorilla gardening project on, on uh, some land above my house that's managed by um, somebody. I mean, it's our land, but you know, I don't want to say too much, but you know, like it's, it's an interesting situation. So, but you know, the point is like, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm cultivating the land when, you know, it's, it's not exactly sanctioned. So it's gorilla gardening, it's sort of a gray area. Um, not illegal. It's not illegal. Um, it's just, homeowners association bylaws and bullshit um liability <laughs> um but yeah um yeah so so the inoculums can can be produced uh, cheaply on site again your compost tea your compost so easy like 
literal trash. Like take the trash from your kitchen, throw it into a pile, you're composting, you know? Take take the leaves that fall from the trees, add them there, you know, you, you've got a good compost pile. And then sheet compost, those materials can be required for free. I, I used free wood chips. I used, you know, the leaves that fell around my yard. I, I cut some tree branches down and then used the green leaves. Um, I, I And I chopped and dropped my crops. Like that's another thing we do is we want to keep the roots in the soil when we grow crops. So we don't pull, we don't uproot our, our crops at the end of the season. We just cut them at ground level. And like I, I use all that refuse to, to, for the bottom layer of the sheet compost. Uh, seriously, check out my video. Uh, here's the link again um, if, if you want to see exactly how I did that. Um, and then, yeah, like regenerative agriculture is a technical vehicle which enables an anarchist land ethic. And so this is all in like when you start practicing this, you, you start to uh, think differently. You start to think along the lines of what I like to call it a regenerative mindset. How did I define it? Uh, so I summed up the regenerative mindset uh, with the idea that by listening to and understanding nature, we can help it heal. Uh, by listening to ourselves and our bodies and each other, we can heal ourselves and our communities and build stronger bonds between one another. The regenerative mindset is grounded in the idea of cooperation between us and nature and between each other and is therefore radical and egalitarian. It's mutual aid. That's what the foundation of the of the regenerative mindset, in my opinion, is mutual aid. You know, uh, so it sort of lends itself to egalitarian social relations. When you, Because, again, like social ecology, you know, when you start to change the way you view the rest of, of the life forms on this earth and in the communities of life, you, you begin to view the, the people in your life differently. You begin to see them, you know, as, as partners and, and, you know, what you're trying to do rather than as potential competition. You know, it's like, we could all, you, you, it's like, join me, you know, let's, let's heal the earth, you know, like join me, you know, let, let's go, let's go do a project, you know, let's, let's, you know, do that. And like, I really like this quote from Bookchin. Um, Agriculture becomes the practical day-to-day -day, day -day interface of soil and human communities, the means by which both meet and blend. The food cultivator must live on intimate terms with a given area of land and develop a sensitivity for its special needs, needs that no textbook approach can possibly encompass. The food cultivator must be part of a soil community in the very meaningful sense that he or she belongs to a unique biotic system as well as a given social system. So this is, you know, really one of the most key elements of regenerative agriculture is you need to develop a relationship with your land. You need to listen to the land. You need to be sensitive to its needs. You need to care for the land. And then when you begin to do that, you know, you, you feel more inclined to care for the people in your life. You know, like with my, I live with my parents and then like, as I've been doing this, I'm like, you know, Oh my God, you guys like, you know, what do you want to grow in the garden? You know, like, you know, tell me so we can have nice meals. And, you know, um, with my friends, it's like, Oh, you know, I have all these vegetables. Uh, you know, come, let me share them with you. Do you want, you know, some, some herbs? I, I give my partner stuff all the time. She's great. Um, I know she's uh, listening to this. I love you. <laughs> um, and it's, it's just like, you know, developing that sensitivity. And then, you know, that sensitivity towards the land, you know, translates itself. I think into the sensitivity towards people, you know, um, it's, it's just, you know, it's like compassion that starts with the land that bleeds over to compassion within your social relationships and then vice versa. It becomes like a sort of spiral of compassion and mutual aid, you know, it's beautiful. So let's talk about growing movement. What can we do as individuals? You know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, you know, we're isolated from everyone, you know, there's, you know, we, talk about organizing, it's the most difficult time to organize of all, pretty much, you know, at least that in, in our living memory, you know. Um, so what can we do? Like practice regenerative agriculture and imply permaculture at home. We'll talk about permaculture in a minute because permaculture is all this in a broader sense. Um, so practice regenerative agriculture, do it. Just just go out there and cultivate the land, you know, like, and and if you, if you need help with that, you know, please contact me. You can message me through my Instagram. I'll give you my Instagram details. I'm always happy to give guidance and, and advice. You know, I'm, I I believe, you know, I've, I've been studying all this and working so hard to learn about this for so long. And, you know, of course, you know, as somebody who really believes in anarchist values, knowledge should be free, you know. Um, and, and if you need that knowledge, you know, if you need help, I will help you. You know, sharing knowledge and education is mutual aid. You know, I'm happy to help. Please, please contact me if you want guidance. Um, I, I will answer any questions you have to the best of my abilities. Um, and we'll we'll have time for Q&A after this, it looks like, uh, since we went over. Um, 
actually we're, we're running out of time. So I'm going to speed through the rest of this. You know, this is a long presentation. So peer, educate your friends and do some guerrilla gardening with them. Guerrilla gardening is a great, you know, uh, subversive activity you can do with your friends. You know, um, my, my partner and I, we went out to that hillside and we're planting a food forest, you know. Uh, so do guerrilla gardening, you know, find a, a piece of land in your community that has been neglected, that, you know, needs to be healed and, and just go there and plant some food, you know, whether that's just planting a couple of trees there or, you know, having a full scale garden and maybe see like, you know, through your efforts, if you could actually acquire rights to the land after a certain period of time. And there's been a whole movement for that in Los Angeles that has been very successful community. Now we scale it up. This is succession. You know, this is succession modeling, you know. Just like as, you know, you start with barren ground, you start with, you know, a little sprout, a little sprout of a, a weed, if you want to call it, a pioneer plant, the individual, we move up to a forest, a revolutionary forest established. And now we're, we're in the middle, you know, you know, where we're starting to really regenerate things and create an ecosystem, establish community gardens and teach children about ecology. I'm really big on teaching children. You know, I have a son. I teach him about this stuff, you know, about like regenerative agriculture and the importance of partnering with the land, uh, you know, and, and like how we can, you know, heal the earth, you know. Yes, we have all these issues, but we can heal it, you know. Uh, so teach children about ecology and about healing the earth. You know, they're the next generation. There are um, they're the people who are going to who we're going to pass the torch on to. You know, it's a big job. You know, we have a lot to do to, to heal, to heal the land and heal humanity. So teach children about this, make sure that they have the resources and push for curriculum in schools, you know, of gardening curriculums, you know, that, that have like this sort of foundation in regenerative agriculture. And then from there, like, you know, we've created a base, we've created a bunch of educated people, you know, not only ourselves and our peers, but children who are going to then go on and continue this. And now we have a movement. So prefigure and build a new food system to feed a budding revolution. And when, it, when I say revolution, you know, that term can mean a lot of things. You know, people oftentimes associate that term with violence and, you know, like overthrowing the government. And it's like, you know, like, yes, that's one angle that you could take, but that's not the angle that I take. You know, I, I believe that a revolution is, you know, really just coming together to work to change the system. That's all it is, you know, work to change the system, you know, to transform it on a systemic level. You know, and that's, you know, once we've built that community, that community, we, it can translate into a movement where now through prefigurative politics, as we talk about in the realm of anarchism, we literally build a revolution. We build a new civilization from the, civilization from the ground up. We build a free ecological civilization where humans partner with nature along the lines of an anarchist egalitarian land ethic. So now we've created our revolution, we're remaking society by doing it, by cultivating the land, by building community. That's what I mean by revolution here, you know? Um, so yeah, um, let's talk about permaculture design really briefly. So permaculture design provides a more holistic framework for partnering with nature. So definitely look into this. Permaculture design is a system of problem solving and decision making protocols based on the patterns of nature. So this is taking regenerative agriculture where we learn from nature to regenerate the earth and scaling it up to our communities, uh, to the way that we construct housing, uh, to the way that we relate to one another, to our economic relations, to our politics, to everything. I, I believe there's a huge intersection between permaculture design and anarchist politics. Um, so definitely, definitely check out permaculture, please. You know, and I wanted to wrap things up with this quote uh, from the Yamamami tribe, the Yanomami tribe, you know, one of the uh, Amazonian uh, tribes in Brazil who have, you know, uh, faced a lot of um, uh, oppression uh, there uh, and, and like colonization of their lands. Um, so the, this quote is, the environment is not separate from ourselves. We are inside it and it is inside us. We make it and it makes us. So now, now that the environment has been degraded, we need to make it better. We need to heal it and in doing so heal ourselves. And uh, so here's some additional free resources. Uh, now's the time to take a screenshot. Um, um, so just uh, if, if you want like these resources, I'm gonna leave this slide on for a minute. Um, I'm gonna see if I can get onto the stream. I'm wondering if anybody has any questions because I wanna open the floor up really quickly if, if we have time. Um, okay, yeah, so, um, all right, that's fine, Logan. Um, yeah, so then uh, my uh, YouTube channel, check me out on YouTube. And check out my Instagram. Uh, follow me, please. Um, 
And uh, I will uh, get on the stream now for my phone and answer questions if you have any questions. If there's any questions at all, open this page in your browser, okay? Open Ecosia. I like I like Ecosia. <laughs> Plant trees. All right, it's not letting me enter from my phone, so I'll just I'll just end my screen share. Um, I'm sorry for taking so long. I was hoping that we had time to answer questions, but you know, please, if you have questions, you know, just just uh, um, hit me up on Instagram. Oh yeah, can you explain how you can't preserve the environment according to ecology? Uh, that I I suppose I can answer that question really quickly. Uh, so ecosystems are never static; they're never ever ever static. So it's literally impossible to preserve them. Um, so ecosystems are always changing; things are always shifting. You know, um, a fire will come through and, and roll back the clock of succession. You know, and then the ecosystem will regenerate. You know, the species composition is always changing. You know, since the climate is constantly changing, you know, people like to say the climate is changing, but those changes are usually small and gradual. So ecosystems are gradually changing. You know. And uh, so, like, you can't preserve it. Like, you can wall it off, but, like, you know, given that humans are a part of nature, we need to accept that we're a part of nature. And, and you know, we just need to understand what that means in terms of the ways that we should interact with it. We should interact with it in a constructive way and instead of a destructive way. And, you know, what that really means is for us that we need to do is we need to understand ecology. We need to understand how how – how ecosystems work and, and therefore how we can work with them and practice mutual aid uh, with the communities of life that we are a part of. Um, yes, yeah, second nature, third nature. nature. Um, yes, definitely look into Bookchin. Uh, he really outlines a lot of this. I, I love Bookchin's work, uh, but um, he's not the only one who has done this kind of like transformative, you know, ecological thinking. So, well, there's lots of wonderful folks out there in, in the realm of environmental thought with like more radical perspectives of how we can transform society and stuff like that. Yep. Anyways, um, you know, if again, uh, if we want to cut it off now, Logan, that's perfectly fine. I hope you all enjoyed. <laughs> I know that was long and extensive. <laughs> No, it was absolutely wonderful. And we definitely thank you for joining us here. And, you know, we hope that people enjoyed it. And we hope that people enjoy watching the videos afterwards. Um, you know, sorry to all our viewers as far as being a little behind earlier. Um, but hopefully we'll get kept, caught up soon. And um, I guess we will transition right into our next panel, which is the... Center for a Stateless Society panel. So yeah. thank you so much, Andy. Yeah, thank you. A quick question. Will, will I be able to access a recording of that too? Uh, because I have to go get a COVID test now. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's on your YouTube channel. And then uh, the stream is on your YouTube channel. And then we can also uh, uh, send video as well. So thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course, of course. And thank you all. Uh, love you guys. I, I hope this inspired you because oftentimes it's like doom and gloom with the environment, but it's, it's really not. We can do this. We can, we can literally go out there and heal the land right now. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. There's so much to, so much, you know, to be optimistic about in my opinion, despite all this. Thank you, everyone. Absolutely. Absolutely.